Welcome to COS15 virtual side event. Our event will be beginning now. This is the Disability Inclusive Democracy Building Participatory Societies. Amazing. Thank you, Janine. And hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who are with us today. Welcome to Disability Inclusive Democracy side event for COPS 20, COPS 15. Um, my name is Sara Minkara, and I'm the US Special Advisor on International Disability Rights. Um, before I get started, I just want to first um, give a shout out and a huge thanks to the amazing team from the Department of State, USAID, and also IFIS, who are hosting this event, um, who are putting together, who put together the logistics and the content and everything for this event. So thank you so much for everyone who are with us. Thanks to the amazing speakers who we will hear from shortly, who are participating from across different parts of the world. Um, and thanks for all of you who are tuning in and really participating with us. Um, before we dive in, one of the things I always ask of all of us here is um, let's bring our true authentic self to this conversation. Let's have an amazing dialogue around civilian inclusive of democracy. I'm going to make it as interactive as possible. We would love to hear from you. We would love to learn from you. And we would love to really um, take this conversation forward. So as I mentioned, the session is around disability inclusive democracy. We all know that to really achieve full prosperity, peace and security on a global level and national level and regional level, we need to be including everyone. We need to be moving forward on a path of democracy. And when we're saying everyone, that also includes persons with disabilities. How do we ensure persons with disabilities are able to access voting rights? are able to run for political office, are able to be part of the, uh, the policy development and framework. How do we make sure that we're looking at civilian inclusive democracy, not just from a rights-based lens, it's the right thing to do. How do we make sure that we really truly believe that when we include persons with disability into our democratic process, everyone benefit, society benefit, there's value to it, it's not just the right thing to do. How do we make sure when we're talking about disability inclusive democracy, there's a phrase in the disability world called, uh, that's, that goes, nothing about us without us. How do we make sure we take a step further and we say nothing without us? We need to be part of all conversations within our democratic, democratic process, even beyond just the disability lens, because we have value to bring across the board. How do we make sure when we're looking at disability inclusive democracy, we're not just looking at it from a technical lens, right? Let's make sure there's certain policies and laws and regulations in, but we're looking at it from adaptive lens, a lens where we're really digging into the core challenges and seeing what does it take for us to really achieve full inclusion of persons with disability into, into our democracies. So we are joined by four amazing panelists where I'm going to introduce um, each speaker. And then I'm going to allow them to um, ask them a certain question, and then we'll take it from there. And then after each speaker, I'm actually going to turn it over to all of you, and where I'm going to ask you guys a question. And my colleague Anne Cody will be in many ways my eyes because I am blind, and she'll kind of call on people's hands. So I would love for you, if you want to speak up, just raise your hand or write in the chat box or the Q&A section, and she will um, read those out to me. Again, let's make it interactive, let's make it fun, let's make it um, where we learn from one another and we take it forward. Um, okay, so to start off with, I am honored and proud to introduce a colleague, a friend, a leader, Acting Assistant Secretary Lisa Peterson. Lisa has served in the U.S. Government Foreign Service Office, uh, uh, Officer for over 30 years, has served as an ambassador for Kingdom of Eswatini, has also um, served in a lot of different leadership roles, including leading the Democracy and Human Rights Labor Bureau. She's also also led in the development of the Summit for Democracy. And I'm excited for Ambassador Pearson to tell us more about the Summit for Democracy, what action, what action steps we are taking forward, what are learning moments, and what can we what can we learn? Thank you so much, Ambassador Pearson. Over to you. Thanks very much, Sara. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to join today's COSP side event to provide just a few remarks to this very impressive panel of experts gathered to brief us. Um, I want to welcome the members of our distinguished panels, uh, Senator Liazat Kaltaeva from Kazakhstan, Lizalot Korea, head of the Gender and Non-Discrimination Unit of the National Electoral Institute in Mexico, 
and uh, Mushaig Hovsepian, president of the Disability Rights Agenda NGO in Armenia. I think this event really underscores a pressing priority, the need for inclusive, accessible democracies that enable each person to fully participate. Um, as Sarah mentioned, in December of 2021, President Biden convened a broad and diverse group of world leaders from government, civil society, and the private sector at a virtual summit for democracy. The summit focused on three themes, strengthening democracy and countering authoritarianism, fighting corruption, and promoting respect for human rights. As part of that event, the United States, Norway, and the UK co-hosted a side event on disability inclusive democracy under the summit's promoting respect for human rights theme. Three key themes arose from that event. The first was intersectionality, both in building coalitions among other groups of marginalized populations to fight for greater access for all, and looking within the disability rights community to ensure that individuals who are further marginalized because of additional identities beyond disability are welcomed and respected. The second was better education for the elections community to ensure that persons with disabilities can participate in this part of the democratic process. And the third was the, la the, the role that a lack of resources and representation play in continuing the marginalization of persons with disabilities from political processes and civic life. Strong inclusive laws developed in consultation with advocates experiencing a range of disabilities are necessary, but not sufficient. The laws need accountability measures, the public needs to understand the laws, and government and non-governmental groups need to monitor compliance. Panelists at this meeting referenced either being discouraged from pursuing political ambitions due to their disability, or having political opponents use stigma and stereotypes against them in campaigns. Others noted that discriminatory laws remain on the books in too many countries, preventing otherwise eligible voters from accessing the ballot. The absence of accessible infrastructure, communications, and voting procedures is yet one more barrier to full inclusion. The erroneous assumption that accessible technology is too expensive or complicated prevents many governments from taking necessary steps to correct these problems. But there's good work happening around the world. And we heard several examples. A couple of these were in Pakistan, women with disabilities restricted to their homes due to COVID-19 took to the internet for advocacy training and developing local action plans. Persons with disabilities were invited to test accessibility features of the elections process and identify barriers that could be removed in advance of election day. We, we also heard about Mexico's elections management body, which recruited more than 1,500 persons with disabilities for polling station officer positions and created training materials for all election officials on how to ensure quality service for voters with disabilities. So I'd like to draw on those good examples and end my remarks on a hopeful note, building on what we think is really positive momentum. During this year of action, the United States is gathering information through events such as this one to develop a disability inclusive democracy action plan. This will lay out best practices and recommendations to make participation in democracy inclusive and accessible. At its root, political action is simply communities using their rights of free speech and assembly to demand action from their government leaders and include their knowledge and experience in policy decisions. Governance and disability rights are strengthened by the actions of leaders like you who uphold the motto, nothing about us without us. 
We value your insights and your commitment to democracy. And I want to thank you very much for your participation and your contributions to this important effort. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ambassador Pearson. And um, this is a good segue to Lisa Lett, um, Coroya. As Lisa mentioned, the Mexican Election Commission has done amazing work towards electoral processes that are more inclusive and accessible for persons with disabilities. But before Lisa, Lett, I ask him a question. If you can just introduce yourself and your work to um, our community here, it would be lovely. Thank you. Thank you, uh, as you already said, and uh, very nice uh, to see you all of you here. My name is Lisa Lutkarea, Head of Gender and Non-Discrimination Unit at the National Electoral Institute in Mexico. And I'm very grateful for the, the opportunity to share with you the Mexican state experiences on the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the democratic process and the challenges that, uh, that we are still pending on. Uh, as you already mentioned, uh, we are, uh, uh, in the last electoral process, we uh, implement a set of measures and facilities to improve and, and to guarantee the participation of people with disabilities. So I would like to share with you some of them and uh, in order uh, that this could be useful for you and the future electoral processes. Perfect. So that's so to my first question. Yes, tell us more about how you made your electoral process more inclusive. My next question to that is going to be how do you get to where you are and what are the challenges you face making the more the electoral process more inclusive and what learning lessons you can take forward and really um just you know share with us as other election management bodies are hoping to make their electoral process more inclusive. Well, uh, I will summarize the recommendation based on Mexican experience. First, uh, people with disabilities face structural disadvantages, physical barriers, ignorance, prejudice, stereotypes, and also how harmful practices uh, which increase inequality gaps. The recognition of discrimination issues implies the need to implement actions to guarantee their political and electoral rights for persons with disabilities. And those actions must be done jointly with the participation of people with disabilities. Second, inclusion is fundamental premise of any democratic system. Therefore, uh, legislative reforms must be introduced to ensure non-discrimination based on disability, which affects human dignity and restrict political and electoral rights. There must be a commitment to assume and accomplish national legislation and international agreements. Third, understanding all types of disability is key to identifying and implementing the actions required according to the needs of persons with physical, mental, intellectual, and sensory disabilities. This knowledge will enable electoral institutions to establish policies, rules, and accessibility measures to promote and protect their electoral rights. Information and data are disaggregated by sex, age, Place of, place of residence and type of disability will allow to recognize the target population and their needs for future electoral process. Fourth, executing proportional inclusivity based on the principles of equality and progressive values is required. Gender mainstream, mainstreaming and other cross indicators such as ethnicity, age, or economic condition must be considered to ensure effective actions. For the election management bodies, it is crucial to identify the immediate needs to promote the dialogue and coordinate activities with civil organizations of persons with disabilities to execute appropriate and accessible measures. Fifth, the electoral authorities must promote that voting actions, facilities, and materials are accessible. To facilitate voting of persons with disability, it must be considered measure, measures such as braid templates, sign language support, special screen, assistance in voting by persons of their own choice, guide dog assistance, and accessible physical spaces. In addition, training courses and protocols to promote no discrimination as citizen at the citizen attention office and polling stations is being required. 
We strongly recommend the design and operation of quotas for persons with disabilities as an affirmative action, which provides them the opportunity to be elected and exercise their leadership's decision-making in public life and political representation. And six, to carry out actions to lead with political parties to consider their normative documents measures aimed to ensuring the representation of persons with disabilities, identifying among their militants those who wish and being able Able to participate as candidates. Finally, evaluating the policies and activities undertaken is compulsory to improve further decision in accelerating the full inclusion of persons with disabilities to consolidate an inclusive democracy. Those are some of the measures that uh, the Institute undertake to, uh, to provide um, and make more inclusive uh, uh, the participation of people with disabilities. Uh, we also face uh, a lot of challenges mm -hmm. and probably the principal, uh, the main challenge that we face is that, is that uh, we have to recognize that there, there, is, uh, there are different types of, uh, of disabilities and we need to promote uh, different measures for different kinds of disabilities. Uh, we are very aware of mobility, disability, and person uh, who, who has auditive uh, limitations of impairments or, or visual uh, disabilities. However, we have to work with the mental and intellectual disabilities uh, people in order to uh, um, uh, gain uh, the participation of uh, these, uh, the, the people with mental and um, intellectual disabilities to be part the whole, uh, in the whole process uh, or in the whole electoral process. Probably that's the, the main, um, the main challenge that we are facing. And the second challenge that we all facing is that uh, once we establish the quotas for people with disabilities, uh, the political parties were not prepared to uh, impulse uh, to the, uh, to a uh, to provide uh, the the needed support for the people with disabilities in order to support the campaigns. And think I think this is probably one of the of the challenges that we are all facing. And also we are re realizing not uh, the electoral process, but when the people with disability is already taking a, 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 a legislative uh, a seat at the, the representative legislation as the chamber, they are not also prepared to provide the measures and facilities required for the people with disabilities. Probably those are the main, main um, challenges that we are, as government, we are facing right now. Amazing. Lisa, thank you so much. And these amazing steps that you guys are, have taken um, have been recognized by the International World Zero Project. And there's a lot that we can learn from these steps. And these challenges that you've mentioned are probably challenges that we can all relate to. My question to you is, it takes it takes a lot of will, political will, societal will to really say to the system, okay, this is important. We want to make sure we have disability inclusive democracy as part of one of our values. What do you think it took for INE to really be able to push this forward? What, where did the will come from? Okay, well, uh, the will is part of what we need for sure. And after that, we already got uh, those uh, willing, the will from the authorities. We have to enforce uh, the training and uh, courses in order that all the people that being related with the electoral process being involved of what the, what the people with this, this capacity, the, with disabilities needs. And probably, this is the second thing that we have to do. And also to promote dialogue with uh, people with disabilities. This is for sure one of the most important things to do. Uh, we, the person who, uh, that, uh, or we, the, uh, we, when we don't have any disabilities, we cannot recognize what, we, what uh, is needed. So dialogue, analysis, reflection, and compromise and commitment 
and commitment with those uh, organizations have to be uh, crucial. Also, I think it's um, very important that uh, legislative measures for political and electoral right to protect, uh, that protects and, uh, and uh, that protects human rights uh, will enable us to assume responsibilities, not only for the electoral management bodies, but also to political parties, educational institutions, uh, of non-civil societies, uh, non-civil organization, and other governmental uh, authorities according to their duties to guarantee the rights of the person with disabilities. And we have to, to mention that, um, as already said, uh, it's fair to recognize that electoral institutions face limitation, limitations such as budget ability, availability to improve the decision making on the accessible needs of persons with physical, mental, and sensory and intellectual impairments. Therefore, it's necessary to have adequate financial resources to progressively implement measures that allow progress in the real and effective inclusion of people with disabilities. And finally, uh, during, uh, during the electoral process, as already said, affirmative action must be implemented. And the potential and the political parties have an enormous responsibility to consider their militants, persons with disabilities, and implement all kinds of facilities to support their electoral campaigns and public life participation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Lisa, let, I'm going to turn it over to the community here. And I want to, um, for everyone in this, um, with us joining us here today, any uh, any reaction to what Lisa had mentioned? Any thoughts on best practices that you've seen um, in different parts of the world? Any comments also on challenges that you've seen? Would love to hear from you. Um, and this is where, um, Anne, if you can see if there's any hands raised or anything in the chat box, that would be great. And then we'll take it from here. Okay, I'm with you. Okay. Here's one comment from the chat box. I think citizens with disabilities are not well educated enough about their rights and how to vote. Mm -hmm. Education for people with disabilities and their rights is really important, definitely. If anyone has their hand up. Would love to hear from people if you've seen other best practices, other steps that we can learn on really making our electoral process more inclusive. Okay, I cannot see all 122 of our participants. So if somebody has a view, if somebody is raising their hand, please let me know. At this moment, this is Janine, we have no hands raised. No hands, okay, great. Um, and there's nothing else in the chat box. Okay, we'll come back to this, but definitely, oh yeah. Sorry, sorry. Hands, oh, Janine. sorry there's two hands raised, I heard. Yep, two hands raised, yes. Yes. Um, can someone call on them or unmute them, please? <laughs> Wilson Charles, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Thank you, Virginia. <clears throat> I, I think he needs to be unmuted. Okay, can anyone hear me? Yes, beautiful. Okay. Yes, <laughs> go for it. No, okay. no. So, um, Somebody mentioned education, and I feel like this is um, one of the issues um, that people face around the world when, when, with respect to um, advocacy or even when involved in politics. Actually, um, during your expose, uh, I can remember uh, one person talked specifically about um, how people with disabilities can be marginalized even when they are trying to run for office. And this is something that I've experienced um, Sorry, um, this is something that I've been experiencing in the first place because I, I was uh, a district chair um, and it, it was really, really, really tough even to try to recruit people with disabilities because they don't believe in them and they think they can't do anything. And partly, I don't think it's because people with disabilities don't have the education is how we educate the, how do we educate the public um, to help them understand that somebody, a person with a disability, the person may have an issue physically, but once the, if the person is capa capable mentally or intellectually, they are capable of doing anything. That's, the, that's one approach. The second approach, um, and I would like you to talk about that in terms of challenges. I also was uh, uh, doing a fellowship in Uganda where I was working with uh, 
um, Disabled Persons Union in Northern Uganda. And one of the issues that they have is they do have the education and they do have the will, but they don't have the power and sometimes the economic power to continue the advocacy. For instance, if something was going on in Kampala, they do have to have a way to finance those people who are willing to go to Kampala to um, actually fight for their rights and fight for themselves. And as a result of that, there is a constitutional amendment since 1995 in Uganda that provide a quota for people with disabilities so that they can also be part of the government. Until now, that cannot be fully respected because there's nobody to advocate. And that, that, not that because they didn't have the education, they just don't have the economic um, opportunities to do those things. So I would like you to address those challenges and see if we are trying to promote democracy for all, how can we pretty much address these issues so that those citizens who are part of a marginalized community can be, um, can be empowered? Definitely. First of all, by the, by the way, what's your name? Remind me of your first name. I am Wilson. Wilson, awesome. Thank you so much, Wilson. My pleasure. Um, your comments are very powerful and it's true. And it's really important for us to really see all the different variables that lead to why persons with disabilities are marginalized from our democratic process, right? As mentioned, it's not just that it could be education, but it could also not just be education. It could be will. It could be also the narrative in society. It could be because persons with disabilities are facing many layers of barrier to accessing the system they're in. They're not going to have the economic um, resources to actually run for office. There's so many layers to this. And I think it's important for us when we're diagnosing and really understanding different challenges, we're able to really understand what are the different variables and how can we address some these challenges and having these open and honest dialogues are helpful towards um you know moving towards that so thank you so much wilson i really appreciate it um th there was and 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 you know this is going to be a good segue when we get to the next panelist we're going to talk about running for office and challenges on that front so i would love to kind of dig more into that as well but before we do that um the other hand that was raised um if we can call on that person that would be lovely sure I, and there are two questions in the q a as well Beautiful. So Vincent Bohuo, the floor is yours. Hello, my dear colleagues. Hello. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, we do. OK, I'm Vincent Bohuo from Côte d'Ivoire. Mm -hmm. I'm a member of the Confederation of Persons with Disabilities in Côte d'Ivoire, OK? Mm -hmm. nice and uh, I totally agree with what you said, because also in Côte d'Ivoire, persons with disabilities are facing a lot of challenges to participate in the decision making process. But now we are tackling the issue with the support of AU, European Union and CBM, okay? They are, they are financing a project that is called a um, project for, to, 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 to increase the participation of persons with disabilities in the decision making process, okay? And uh, this issue, uh, we have noticed in that project that we are facing a lot of barriers. Even our electoral code was not disabled compliant, disability compliant. And we had to meet the, 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 the commission for, for electoral commission to try to see how we can, we can reform that code. And since, since two years that now we have started the project is just few few months ago that we have been able to have a workshop with the, the commission just to try to see how we can uh, uh, arrange that, that code. So there are a lot of barriers, even in the, in the, uh, the, the law, there are barriers there are behavioral barriers in our society because people think that persons with disability cannot participate. They don't have the right to participate. They cannot be associated. And we were in the ground, in the, I can say, the, the, the buildings are not, are, not, are not accessible for persons with disabilities. So our report are, are, are trying to, to, to mention all those barriers and try to propose solutions to tackle those barriers. So this, we are still going on with the project. And uh, we, we hope that maybe next year or maybe in the next elections, we are going to see good improvement of the participation of persons with disabilities. So I wanted to share you this experience. We are, we are, we are, we are trying. Okay. Amazing. Can you just remind me of your name and what organization yeah. you're part of? Vincent Bowo. Uh -huh. Vincent Bowo from Côte d'Ivoire, from the Confederation of Persons with Disabilities of Côte d'Ivoire. It's the biggest organization that is gathering all the types of, of, of disabilities in the country. So we are the Confederation. Okay. So. We are trying with the support of AU and CBM, but we hope that maybe 
lot of uh, partners like USID can support us to continue that, that fight for the participation of persons with disabilities. Amazing, awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah. lots to learn from there. Um, we're we're gonna move on. Um, really, really great comments. Um, we're gonna move on to the next speaker. But before we do, and if you just read me the questions, um, and then we can hopefully um, uh, our speakers, if some of these questions you can answer them in your in, in your conversation, that would be, that would be lovely. Um, yes, I will do that. Thank you. The first question is from Shinere Onuoha. And she or he would like to know if there is an international law or treaty that concerns persons with disabilities in governance. The second question is for Ms. Correa. And the question is from an election organizer perspective, what else can election management bodies do to include persons with disabilities in addition to consulting with them? Mm -hmm. Um, and, let, oh, sorry, yeah. mm -hmm. and the third question, uh, oh, sorry, that was from Rebecca Alberg. The third question is from George Katumba. I want to know how USAID is tasking governments to ensure that elections are inclusive. Mm -hmm. Amazing, thank you. And Lizabeth, if you can briefly just uh, respond to the second question that was referred to, and then I'm gonna um, hand over to the next speakers. Yes, uh, we are implementing a lot of uh, seminars and, uh, and different um, set of uh, group, uh, groups with people with disability in order to promote the dialogue. And um, in all the um, all the materials that we are making, uh, and then they are promoted at the National Electoral Institute, has been reviewed by people with disabilities and, and non uh, non governmental organizations in order to provide the view of of those uh, of those person of the of the people with disabilities and make uh, more, more accurate uh, materials. And that's that's one of the way we are including the people. And also nowadays, the Institute is working on the Mexican standard on uh, uh, the Mexican uh, standard in, uh, in labor and non-discrimination, which consider the participation uh, the, which consider the implementation of good practices regarding corresponsibility in, co in, in workers, personal, family, and work life, ensuring equal treatment and opportunities, integrated gen a gender perspective into the recruitment process, selection, mobility, and training, ensuring for equity, and also establish uh, some requirements for public, private, and, and uh, in, in established requirements. Uh, as a as a work center, uh, in order to integrate, implement, and execute with their management uh, within their management and human resources process, labor equality and non discrimination practice to promote workers' integral development, including people with disability with disabilities. So we are now uh, working on that and probably in the near future we are uh, we are uh, working we are increased the number of persons who has a uh, disability working at the uh, at the institute and uh, this will allow us to um, be uh, to um, increase the aware of the needs of people with disabilities in order to um, improve uh, the measures that we are already uh, implemented. Amazing, thank you, Elisalet. Um, That's really awesome work. So now, just sensitive time, on to the next speaker. Um, I am honored to introduce um, Senator Yoset Kultieva, the first Senator with a, a person with a disability in Kazakhstan. Um, she's a leader in many ways, um, and I'm excited for her to introduce herself and her kind of background and her story, and then I'll dig into my question. Go for it, Senator. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening in Kazakhstan. <laughs> uh, hello, Sarah. I, so I'm so to glad to again. see you via screen. Uh, hello, Virginia, and many, many my colleagues and my partners. Uh, I know and I love Rebecca. 
with um, yes, six months ago, I was a leader of the OPD Organization of Persons with Disabilities, named Association of Women with Disabilities, Shirak in Kazakhstan, uh, which org, uh, was established in 2001 uh, and uh, which uh, promote, prom is promoting uh, the rights of uh, women with disabilities. And um, uh, one of the program uh, in uh, our organization was the public and political participation of women and men with disabilities. Uh, we run many, many uh, different activities and uh, projects and programs uh, towards the promotion of uh, public and political participation. And um, one of those um, programs was uh, to promote not only uh, active electoral rights, but also passive, uh, uh, the right to be elected. And um, in Kazakhstan, uh, in autumn 2021, uh, Kazakhstan uh, introduced uh, the uh, change in its law uh, and introduced a quota in political parties and uh, the parliament uh, for persons with disabilities. Uh, personally, I'm uh, I'm not uh, so uh, happy to talk about the quota, but I think that uh, in our society, um, this positive discrimination uh, temporarily, I, I believe that it's for some time uh, uh, measure will be very helpful for persons with disabilities to run their seats at the table to have their own mic to raise their own voices. And um, in February, uh, I was uh, appointed by the president of the Republic of Kazakhstan uh, to, the, to be a senator. Amazing. Thank you so much, Senator Kolkieva. Um, so uh, based on what you just said, right, um, we need more persons with disabilities like you who are in leadership, who are able to be part of the political framework. What are the challenges that people with disabilities face when running for office? And how can we address these challenges? As you said, quota, to be honest, doesn't always address the issue at hand. What do we need to do to really create a pathway for persons with disabilities to be able to run for political office? Um, I will talk uh, about the situation in Central Asia, yes. you know, five countries. Uh, you know that, uh, first of all, uh, I think that we need to, to run more leadership programs. Mm -hmm. uh, in regards of Central Asia, I think that we still uh, face uh, the um, legacy of the former Soviet Union system. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are still Russian speaking uh, societies, communities. And uh, we still feel the Iron cur Curtain um, legacy. And uh, our societies in Central Asia, we need uh, to be mainstreaming uh, in the disability movement, international disability movement. It's first of all. The second one, um, I would like to say that uh, if uh, in Kazakhstan, for example, uh, we uh, uh, worked many years to uh, ensure the, um, that the voting system, the uh, polling stations, uh, the um, election processes are accessible for persons with disabilities. Um, we see that uh, our government, governments uh, see us only as a voters, but uh, I think that um, civil society in our countries much, must to say to our governments that pe people with disabilities, persons with disabilities, appear in at least four roles in electoral processes, mm -hmm. as a voter, as a candidate, mm -hmm. 
as observer mm -hmm. and as a member of the election commissions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to uh, ensure that persons with disabilities can uh, exercise their rights and uh, feel free to uh, act as an observer, for example, or a member of the commission. And I think that um, we have to work more with political parties mm -hmm. because um, I think that uh, many of us know that political parties are very, very active before the elections. They uh, start to remember the persons with disabilities and their rights and they use persons with, dis with disabilities and their, our interest uh, in regards of the future near elections. But we have to uh, work more with political parties uh, so they uh, realize the potential of the persons with disabilities as the voters and as the uh, leaders in, their, in these parties. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, to, to our community, I would love for you to think about any questions for Senator Kotieva on what she said. I mean, it's really important um, that she, what she mentioned regarding how do we really make sure that there's, you know, persons with disabilities across these four elements, whether it's uh, voting rights, um, being a candidate, observer, election commission, how do we make sure persons with disability are part of all these different elements and also are seen through a value-based lens in all of these elements. Questions for the Senator, also from your own experience, what have you seen? What are the challenges you've seen? And also what are innovative um, uh, experiences or stories you've also seen, uh, some positive ones that you've seen as well? You know, uh, Sarah, um, when I was young, mm -hmm. um, I met a Senator. Mm. Uh, she was um, an old woman and I told to her that uh, I dream that uh, one time um, I will I, I will be a parliamentarian, and I bring the voices of the uh, youth with disabilities. I was young, um, persons with disabilities in our government, in our state bodies, uh, because I am a disabled woman. I am a woman with disabilities, disability, and. You know that um, that senator, she told me, Lazat, uh, you must to keep in mind that you have to be elected not because you have a disability. You have a right to be elected because you are citizen, because you are right holder. And uh, uh, I understand now that I represent in uh, the parliament of Kazakhstan, not only persons with disabilities. And I think that persons with disabilities who are interested in running uh, for office, uh, they will represent the interest of all elders, of minorities, of different, different communities and uh, individuals. And they have uh, to, uh, to raise their um, capacity to, to be elected and to be on equal um, with other candidates and other parliamentarians who are not persons with disabilities. And you know, Senator, that's very powerful what that Senator told you, because it's true, because we tend to actually in a lot of spaces be pigeonholed from the perspective, oh, I'm a person with disability and I'm just gonna only focus on the disability lens or disability community. I am gonna be elected because I'm here to serve my entire country, all of my citizens, and I have value to bring to that table. It goes back to that phrase, nothing without us. And we need to really be able to internalize that and believe that. And that's, so that is a very powerful um, statement. Um, Sarah? Yes. If I might interject, we have uh, Senator Raza Diva um, in the seminar today, and she has her hand up. So I believe she probably oh, has people some, to join us. Great. Yeah, I imagine okay. she has some relevant information to share. So okay, great, awesome, Senator Adiba. Um, yes, over to you. And if you can also introduce yourself, and thank you for being able to make it as well. 
Assalamu alaikum. Um, I'm uh, Senator Rasidi Barazi. I'm sorry, I couldn't join much earlier because I'm in between flights and I'm at the Heathrow Airport. And I've been listening in and I, I, I'm so pleased to hear of so uh, uh, many developments and movements and, um, and, 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 and what has been done um, in, in all uh, parts of the world with all our friends. Um, I just want to say, um, Sarah, if I may um, yes. um, say something yes. about what Senator just um, uh, mentioned just now. I, I'm, I'm so pleased to hear um, um, how she feels, um, you know, on, on empowering persons with disability, uh, in particular um, in politics. But um, I have to say one thing is uh, that we need to do together is actually to create more awareness um, mm -hmm. via the media, because I feel that uh, once we do that and uh, all persons with disability come out um, in, in, in their own ways, um, showing their abilities, um, people will see that we are here to stay and that they can't push us around. Um, we work very closely here with uh, the Election Commission. And what we do is we do ex uh, audit access in all the electoral um, 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 you know, constituencies uh, for the elections. And we've done four uh, at, at different different states um, in, in the bill up for the general election. And what we do is we make sure one, there is support for persons with disability and also the elders. And uh, we make sure that, um, you know, there are ramps there. But most of the buildings are actually old buildings, old schools. So they make do uh, with uh, ramps, you know, um, uh, the, the movable ones. And then um, they don't have a, um, accessible toilet because they're old buildings, but they assist uh, whenever they can. And instead of doing um, the ballot uh, and, and also registering on, on the first floor or the second floor, we've requested for all to be done on the ground floor. So um, that's been um, happening for the last couple of years, and uh, we've seen so much progress, and we are very, very happy, especially when most of us are using wheelchairs, you know, sometimes when we want to slide in um, to vote. Um, sometimes the tables are not, um, you know, um, uh, not con con or rather not accessible for us, so we've requested for them to use the, the school tables, which is a bit higher, things like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, it's not easy for us to have uh, sign language interpreters at the different different constituencies, but we do our very best by using um, WhatsApp or Telegram, uh, where we have the um, uh, sign language interpreters uh, at hand to assist uh, if there are any problems. But most of the time, we have it um, written uh, all the information. Um, just now, we were talking about um, having uh, difficulty uh, being more and more of us in Parliament. I have to agree with that in Malaysia, we've had, um, I, I am the third center uh, thus far. Um, I'm the only one in the upper house. There's mm -hmm. none in, uh, in the, the lower house. But um, what I've been doing is, is I've been uh, working with all the members of parliament on um, both houses to share on how best we can support persons with disabilities. Uh, not just um, um, for us to come out and vote and, and you know um, have our rights heard, but also for us to uh, have more persons with disabilities um, as member of parliament. Um, you know, it's it's not easy for for us to convince people that uh, we are uh, just this is good uh, or even better than them. But in order for us to do that, we need to come out in throngs. We need to show people our abilities. Otherwise, they would think that you know they uh, that we don't have what it takes to become parliamentarians. You know, to become leaders um, of our community. So um, I, I, all I have to say is to all our friends all across the world, uh, you've got to dress up, get up and show up and tell everyone and show to everyone uh, all um, the abilities, qualities and, and have the world here, um, you know, um, uh, about us. And um, the most important thing is, like I said, is to create awareness via the media. The media needs to know um, about us. The media needs to know about how to create awareness and um, how important it is for us um, to have our voice in, in parliament because this, as you mentioned, Sarah, nothing about us without us. Um, it's very frustrating first, uh, sometimes um, frustrating as a woman in parliament, second, as a person with disability. But as I went along as I uh, in parliament um, and, and I mingled around, um, actually, um, they don't have anything um, uh, bad to say about us, but they just feel that, you know, we're not showing up. So that's why they feel that we're not interested at all. Thank you so much. Senator Adiba, thank you so much. And, um, you know, to, to your, to your uh, 
point on media, and I mean, it's a really important point, and this is something that even um, in the State Department, one of our priorities is focusing on narrative change. You know, we need to disrupt the narrative surrounding disability because ultimately the narrative is what's leading to this marginalization, including in this uh, democratic process. And ultimately, we really need to engage media and engage in the right way, because if we think about it, the way media really presents persons with disabilities right now is very much either, either from the charity pity lens or as we call it on the other side, the inspiration porn lens. Disability is not yet, you know, normalized in a way that we are people with value and we need to be seen through that lens. So engaging media is really important. And then to your other point, you know, I think something that we individually can do, I'm not talking about from a systemic level, organization level, but even from an individual community level, you know, I, I always say that if my entire life I've always heard you can't, you're not able to, you're nothing, you're less than, I will, I'll believe that. I'll internalize that. And if someone tells me, you know, you know, Sara, you know, why haven't you accomplished anything so, so far? Again, if I've internalized the ableism, I'm not going to be able to believe in my value. And this is why it's so important for each of us to really look at the next person sitting next to us and say, I see you, I hear you, and you bring value. And I, we need to do that to everyone that we come across. And that's part of changing narrative as well. So thank you, Senator Adiba. And so, thank you, thank Senator Kotiva. Like, seriously, um, what you've shared is really powerful. I want to open it up just um, briefly. I do want to open up briefly just um, one question or comment from the audience, and I want to go over to um, over to then Moshe because I want to make sure we give um, we leave the last 20 minutes. So but uh, one comment or question from the community on this topic. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> um, Amal Sharif, okay. you have the floor. Hi, hello, Sarah. How are you? Hi, we hi. met in Lebanon. Yes, yes, yes. How are you, Amal? How's everything? Yes, all is good. Uh, I, I, I want to, to highlight something very important. As I, I ran the elections in 2016 in Beirut for a municipality, as I told you when you were here, I need, we need in, in the Arab region to, to, to launch leadership programs because people are not running. Because when I ran the elections in Lebanon, People thought that I'm running the election due of pity of my disability to get votes while I was running to represent everyone in the community. We need to highlight this issue because it's really difficult and people are, we are excluded. We, we, they don't see us as, as candidates and even in the last elections, the infrastructure in Lebanon, it wasn't accessible to vote freely. Mm -hmm. So my question is how to help us in these uh, communities where everything is all behind. Yeah. We would like to, to learn from everyone's experience and to, to learn and to build our leadership program for running the elections uh, maybe in, 2000, in 2023 maybe. Mm -hmm. I hope everyone maybe who can help us or answer my questions. I'm, I'm happy to see every, uh, some people from uh, around the world who, who won the, the elections. Thank you. Thank you, Amal, and really good question, and really good point. And I hear a common theme throughout what people have been saying is leadership program, leadership training. Um, and this is a good segue to our last but not least and our amazing uh, speaker from Armenia, Moucher Hovsepian. Sorry, I butchered that last name, but um, I hope I pronounce it somewhat right. Um, Moucher, who is the president of DRA, Disability um, Rights Agenda who has done amazing work around disability inclusion, the legislation reform. Moucher, over to you, Let, tell us your story and then we'll ask, we'll, we'll take it from there. Everyone, nice to meet you all. I'm Moucher Obsepian from Disability Rights Agenda NGO, the president of the NGO, which is an organization led by young people with disabilities. And uh, I'm also the coordinator of the Coalition for Inclusive Legal Reforms, which is a union of uh, 14 organizations 
uh, disability rights organization based in Armenia. Uh, so we try to advocate political rights in Armenia and also uh, support and monitor uh, full implementation of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in Armenia. That's all. And I'm also the co-author of the uh, Law on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and many other uh, co-author or author, author of uh, legal documents that are uh, adopted or are being discussed now in Armenia. Mm. Well, Sheikh, you've done a lot of work um, with, you know, on providing access um, for persons with disabilities into voting, uh, voting rights, uh, political um, participation. What advice do you give parliamentarians, election body com commissions, and disability rights organizations on what you've seen works well, what needs to be done, what can we do more? Um, there are few key things that need to happen in order to make voting more accessible for persons with disabilities. First, uh, election management bodies need to be aware of the barriers that persons with disabilities face uh, when trying to vote and work to remove them. Uh, this includes ensuring that polling stations are accessible, that voting materials are accessible, and that persons with disabilities are able to cast uh, their votes in private. Second, uh, parliaments need to pass laws that uh, require uh, polling places and voting materials to be accessible, and also laws that uh, protect the right of persons with disabilities to vote by secret ballot. Uh, and it's important uh, to recognize the legal capacity of all persons with disabilities, including those with psychosocial disabilities. As you may know, uh, in our country also, persons who are declared as uh, legally incapable are not, uh, don't have the right to vote or uh, to run for office. So it's important to recognize the uh, legal capacity of all persons with disabilities. I'm highlighting the, this uh, for, uh, for every government. Finally, disability rights leaders uh, need to be empowered um, to advocate to these laws and work with election management bodies to ensure that they are implemented, uh, that they are implemented effectively. And here we need formal cooperation between representative organizations of persons with disabilities and election management bodies. So uh, these are the steps that I think that are important for uh, electoral election management bodies, parliaments, and disability rights leaders to work to get to make voting more accessible for all persons with disabilities. Amazing. So I want to bring, I want to kind of bring what Michelle um, just mentioned and across what other, other panelists mentioned as well. I want to kind of wrap everything up into kind of what can we do more. There's a lot of best practices that we've seen and shared right now here, but there's also a lot of challenges. There's been efforts, but there's more that we can do. And to really move forward on disability inclusive democracy, it's adaptive work. It's, it's, a, it's hard work. It's not easy. And if it was easy, it would have been done. And I will say that to do adaptive work, you need to have three elements. One, we need to be having difficult conversation, addressing certain elephants in the room. We need to then also be able to create shared responsibility. So it doesn't just fall on the sh sh shoulders of persons with disabilities. And then we need to take it forward and build capacity of one another so we can actually do the work that we need to do. So my first question to the panelists and the one I wanna open up to the community, what are the difficult conversations we need to be having? Thoughts? May I? Yes, of course, yes, go for it. Um, I guess uh, we need to remove barriers that prevent people with disabilities from engaging in political life, including address stigma against persons with disabilities, because we have a stigma against persons with uh, psychosocial disabilities, especially persons with intellectual disabilities and uh, women with disabilities. And uh, these groups need to be empowered. Uh, and uh, this is difficult topics uh, in developing countries uh, to discuss. And that's why we need the leadership of persons with disabilities and uh, nothing without us about us uh, motto that uh, we lead the movement of changing our systems uh, to make it more inclusive, to make it more democratic way, because 
uh, it cannot be uh, democratic. We cannot call some um, governments democratic if they are not accessible and inclusive to persons with disabilities. And democratic means inclusive and uh, including persons with disabilities and the other minority groups. And it's very important uh, also to ensure that uh, people with disabilities have an opportunity to become members of political parties uh, running for offices and they're uh, and eliminating all legal uh, restrictions that we have including uh, the rights of uh, persons with psychosocial disabilities why i'm highlighting this because uh, in our country it's very uh, problematic because uh, people with disabilities, those uh, who are uh, who have uh, mental health conditions, uh, they are uh, segregated in special institutions may, uh, mainly, and they have no uh, uh, right to vote. And uh, when we uh, discuss the uh, topics of democracies, uh, we need to uh, highlight the importance of uh, the, the, uh, the protection of the rights of persons living in institutions. So uh, the institutionalization and uh, democratic movements are uh, need to be uh, 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 need to be done parallelly. Yeah, yeah definitely. That's definitely. Um, other thoughts? around what difficult conversations we need to be having from our speakers. And if we have raised hands, um, let's also call on them. There, hi, Sarah, it's Ann. There's a comment um, in the chat box, so I'll just read that. It's from Ula Ali. Yes. We need to make sure that people with disabilities in political settings are not an afterthought, but seen as valuable members of the conversation about our society. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. I also want to. Um, this is a this is a slight shift, but Patrick Falconer from Canada points out rightly that in Canada, twenty percent of eligible voters have one or more disabilities. Mm -hmm. Most elections are won by less than twenty percent. How can we best get parties and candidates to recognize and respond to the potential power of this voting bloc? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you, Patrick, for that comment. And thank you, Ola, for, Ola, for the, um, that comment as well. So on this difficult conversation part, right, I think one of the things sometimes um, to, to what Mosheikh said, you know, the, the narrative, the stigma is really important to address, especially also with, um, you know, disabilities like psychosocial disabilities. We need to ha be having these difficult conversations, not with ourselves, but with, with the system at large. How do we really make sure we're we're pushing the conversation and we're disrupting the status quo when it comes to this to the, to, to this to these challenges? Now the next question is, how do we create shared responsibility? Who are the who are the uh, you know variables and the sectors within the system that we're in that we need to make sure we're engaging? We talked about government, of course. We talked about disability organizations, but who else needs to be part of this conversation? I don't see any hands up. Does anyone from the panel want to respond? May I? Yes, of course. OK. Um, um, Sarah, as you said, well, I firmly believe that the dialogue, dialogue should be increased between, for sure, the electoral management bodies, mm -hmm. the political parties. Mm -hmm. Probably uh, the political parties are uh, uh, has to be uh, our main intel, uh, our main um, we, uh, has to be the principal uh, body with it. We have to dialogue, mm -hmm. and also the civil organizations uh, uh, um, uh, with uh, with the representation of people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Everything in order to advance jointly, reaching agreements in the short medium and long term uh, uh, long term regarding the differences between uh, any kind of uh, any type of disabilities and we must pay special attention to women and indigenous people with disabilities implementing action according to their needs uh, because any democracy must be 
consider all type of people. Also, another issue that we have to face right now is violence against women. And violence against women with disabilities, probably with disabilities and probably women, indigenous women with disabilities, is it could be one of the main issues that we have to face in the near future because they have the right to be voted and be elected, and but also we are not be disregard that uh, violence um, according to discrimination and stereotypes, as already said prejudices and bias is, is, is part of the common, um, is part of the, of what the people with disabilities is living, uh, is, is facing, and uh, women and indigenous uh, people with disabilities probably has, uh, are the more vulnerable uh, persons uh, that we have to work with. Definitely, thank you, Lisa, that's really powerful. Um, you know, election management bodies, um, political parties, um, marginalized, other marginalized populations, uh, disability civil societies, I would also add in uh, mainstream civil societies, um, mentioned earlier media, the media sector, to be honest, every single sector needs to be part of this conversation and how to really, how do we really mainstream disability in a narrative and really um, shift the narrative so that way when persons with disabilities are running for political for office, for instance, they are seen through a, through a value lens. Um, I am gonna just give me just one, uh, 223. Okay, great. So we have seven minutes. I just want to leave. I would love to leave the last seven minutes um, to have each of our speakers just share one final comment, word of, of, of advice, anything you would love to share and leave the community with. And I will start off with um, Assistant Secretary Lisa Peterson, and we'll take it from there. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, you know, I'll go back to sort of the three pillars of the Summit for Democracy, um, the uh, countering authoritarianism, addressing and fighting corrupt, corruption and promoting human rights. And I think everyone on this call is already engaged on the promoting and advocating for the human rights of persons with disabilities. And that really is the foundation for the other two pillars. Um, I think by leaning into the inclusive democracy piece and ensuring that voices of persons with disabilities are part of the processes for developing policies and laws, you're building the participatory governance that is key to countering authoritarianism. And finally, on the the, the fighting corruption piece, um, you know, persons with disabilities have the same interest in fighting corruption as any other advocacy group within a society. Money that goes into individual pockets is money that is not there for the service of the people. Um, and the networks that are created by corruption keep voices that are outside of that network out of policy and legislative decisions. And so I think it's critical for people with disabilities, organizations advocating for people with disabilities to really form alliances with other organizations, with other parts of civil society to really take on and counter corruption. And I will stop there. Awesome, thank you, Lisa. Um, over to you, Moshek. Uh, thank you. About your uh, last question, I want to highlight the importance of uh, par international partners. Many developing countries uh, change their electoral systems by the support of other countries, developed countries, and international organizations. Uh, in this respect, the role of development part partners is extremely important uh, in line with the CRPD article 32, uh, which says that states are obliged uh, to ensure the international cooperation, including international development programs, are inclusive and accessible to persons with disabilities. This is very important. And I want to uh, also highlight uh, about my uh, 
uh, hopes about uh, reforms in Armenia. Uh, the Armenia has announced a new constitutional reform uh, initiative. I hope that uh, the Armenian sign language uh, will be recognized as an official language, which will uh, promote the rights of voters and uh, politicians uh, who are deaf or uh, hearing impaired. And the next change I would like to see is the elimination of the restriction on the right to vote uh, of the persons uh, recognized as legally incapable from the constitution. And I hope that the Republic of Armenia uh, will ensure active and full-scale involvement and meaningful consultations uh, with various organizations of persons with disabilities first of all, and uh, including but not limited to women, uh, children with disabilities, uh, refugees, uh, persons living in rural areas, and persons in need of high level of, of support. And uh, I hope that uh, our international partners will ensure that all international cooperation programs are in line with CRPD and uh, are open uh, to people with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Moshe. Thank you for le your leadership. Um, over to you, Senator Kultieva. Your last words of advice. We lost the senator. I'm sorry. Oh, we lost her. Okay. Um, no, no worries. We'll go over to uh, Lisolette, and then if the Senator Adiba is on, we'll also go to her. But Lisolette, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, well, we have the responsibility to implement solid actions, such as allocating financial resources. That's for sure. Uh, probably it's not as expensive as we thought, but we have to allocate and uh, to have resources to uh, improve what we were done. Raising awareness, and training people, obviously, and improving the statistical information available. I think that's for sure one of the things that we have to uh, improve. Having the support of academic institution and civil societies organization has to be continued and implementing quotas. I agree what, 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 uh, of what we have, of, I agree of what, of what being said about quotas. However, implementing quotas uh, guarantee the participation of people with disabilities. And that's what we are looking for. And I consider that one of the groups of people that, uh, with disabilities that we have to work with more is uh, those who have intellectual and mental disabilities. And I think that's uh, the, the, the last thing I, I would like to say, because uh, we have to assure that uh, to be a democratic system, we have to be sure that uh, inclusiveness uh, will be a fact. Thank you so much, Lisa Lett, and for all the amazing work. Um, Senator Adiba, is she on? And is she able to give her last? She jumped off, Adiba? I believe she had to leave. To oh, she had to leave. Okay, she had to catch her legs. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. And thank you, Anne. Um, well, everyone, thank you so much for your participation. Thanks to the amazing speakers um, for everything they shared. Um, lots to think about, lots, lots that we've learned, and we want to continue the conversation forward. Um, you know, the year of action, civil inclusive democracy, um, you know, how can we really be able to make commitments, share best practices and learn and really take this um, conversation forward. And as, a, as Ambassador Peterson mentioned, you know, we're, we're focusing a lot on promoting human rights, which is really important. How do we also address the other issues when it, we're talking about our democracy? How do we make sure people with disabilities are seen through a value-based lens? How do we make sure we're not looking at the issue of inclusion just from a technical lens? And how do we keep this dialogue moving forward? So thank you all for your participation. And yeah, let's stay in touch. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.